right everyone this is an exercise research review and today we're going to focus a little bit on the effects of acute and chronic exercise on blood pressure so i want to note real quickly that anytime i uh, use a video i'm going to uh, be using a textbook and some research papers so uh, make sure to take a look down in the links below if you're interested in an exercise science uh, textbook i have the textbook that i use as well as the more recent version which is a little bit more expensive and then the newer or, or sorry older versions which are cheaper and less expensive um, so these textbooks are useful if you need a textbook for uh, an exercise physiology class uh, or if you're just interested in getting more in-depth information about this stuff uh, as well the research articles are also linked down below that I'm going to use as references uh, for the exercise research review. So make sure to take a look at the links down below if you're interested. So first we need to talk a little bit about what blood pressure is. So in layman's terms, blood pressure is the pressure that blood exerts on your blood vessels throughout your body. Um, this is due to the force and rate of your heartbeat because that's what actually pumps the blood through your blood vessels as well as the vascular compliance and the resistance that your vasculature exerts on that blood flow. Um, so a mixture of uh, increased resting heartbeat and heart rate as well as a stiffer vasculature will increase your heart rate while a more compliant vasculature and a lower resting heart rate will reduce your um, blood pressure. So with that in mind, how can we actually measure blood pressure? So uh, that picture that you saw earlier in the title screen uh, had a spigo manometer on it, which is actually the tool we use to measure blood pressure. And this is kind of a look at how a spigo manometer works. So on a spigo manometer, we have this rubber cuff, which we inflate with air. And the purpose of that is to collapse the brachial artery. Um, and it's only possible to collapse the brachial artery when the pressure applied is greater than the actual pressure of blood on that brachial artery. So that um, you will inflate the cuff to a pressure that is higher than whatever expected blood pressure you have. So if you think that the systolic blood pressure uh, is above 120, you might inflate the cuff to 130 or 140. And then you would slowly release the pressure in the cuff um, so that you could see at what point you heard with the stethoscope the pulse, the blood flow to continue again. So if you heard the blood start to kind of beat again uh, after it got to say 125, that would be your top number. You would know that the systolic blood pressure was about 125. Then you would continue to listen as the blood and beat kept hitting until you didn't hear a beat anymore. And that would be your diastolic blood pressure. So why are these blood pressure measures important? And what are the blood pressure categories per se from the American Heart Association? So a normal blood pressure is a systolic blood pressure that is less than 120 and diastolic blood pressure that is less than 80. While an elevated or pre-hypertensive blood pressure would be 120 to 129 or less than 80. So the high blood pressure or again the pre-hypertension uh, stage would also be 130 to 139 or 80 to 89. High blusher, uh, blood pressure stage 2 is anything above 140 or anything above 90 for diastolic. And then hypertensive crisis, this is when someone has uh, a systolic blood pressure over 180 um, and higher than 120 for diastolic. And so the main reason that we had this categorization is because a higher blood pressure is one of the primary risk factors for things like uh, coronary artery disease, uh, heart disease, and a lot of other risk factors in general. Uh, high blood resting blood pressure is associated 
throughout the life with things like Alzheimer's disease, uh, diabetes, and just a host of other chronic diseases. So it is really important to lower our blood pressures. And this is a major problem um, in American society. Uh, the average blood pressure is very high for most Americans because we live a very sedentary lifestyle and we also eat a very high caloric as well as uh, salt-filled diet. So something to keep in mind, uh, blood pressure is something that if you can manage throughout your life, uh, you're giving yourself a good shot at uh, living a healthy and kind of uh, good uh, life <laughs> and hopefully kind of extending the longevity of it. So now let's take a look at what happens to your blood pressure when you perform a single session of exercise. So if you go out and go for a 20, 30 minute run. What, what, what's happening to your body? How does it respond? What, what is the blood pressure change? And as you can see here, um, as you start to pick up exercise and you start to exercise, your heart rate goes up. And this will also lead to the amount of blood that is pumping through your vasculature. And what this causes is your systolic blood pressure here, as you can see, to go up. However, something that's kind of interesting is that your diastolic blood pressure when you're exercising doesn't really change a lot. Um, so the idea being that as you exercise, your systolic blood pressure will bump up and your diastolic blood pressure will maintain relatively uh, constant. However, as you can see, as soon as you stop exercising, your blood pressure will drop back down, as will your heart rate. So acute exercise will increase your blood pressure in the short term, um, but this effect isn't very long lasting. Additionally, something to keep in mind is that over here on the right, we see that blood pressure is very linearly associated with the intensity of the exercise you're doing. So if you are exercising at a low intensity, it's not really going to change your uh, blood pressure much from your resting blood pressure. And that makes sense because your heart rate's not going as fast and therefore not as much blood, blood flow is occurring. Um, and therefore there isn't as much resistance and pressure on your arteries. Uh, however, as you get closer to that maximal exercise, that is when you see these really high bumps in systolic blood pressure. However, again, if you are healthy and you're exercising normally, your diastolic blood pressure doesn't really change uh, still with uh, increases in intensity. So what happens immediately after you finish an acute bout of exercise? And I found this uh, really interesting. So as you can see here in this uh, research study chart, uh, an acute single bout of exercise, endurance and resistance led to this initial bump in uh, blood pressure, as we might expect based off of those previous um, papers. However, after the exercise stopped, we saw this, you know, decrease down here and then this kind of maintenance. However, what's interesting is that the level of uh, these blood pressures are actually lower than this initial blood pressure. So there's a post-exercise hypotensive period. So what actually happens is it's after you go out and you exercise, you get this big bump in your blood pressure. However, afterwards to compensate, your body actually goes into slight hypotension. And this is due to a reduction in norepinephrine, uh, which is essentially a reduction in your sympathetic nervous system, uh, the one that involves fight or flight and a kind of increase in your parasympathetic nervous system, which is allowing you to relax and recover. This also leads to a reduction in the peripheral vascular resistance. So what happens is you might experience uh, more vasodilation, so your arteries are getting uh, larger and therefore there's less restriction and less resistance on that blood flow. So even though we get this bump in acute exercise, uh, in blood pressure, immediately afterwards, we start to see um, a decrease in blood pressure and then eventually a post-exercise hypotension that can last uh, on the order of many minutes to hours after the actual single session of exercise. And it does depend, obviously, on the intensity and how hard you are working as to whether you're going to see this hypotension. But what's going to happen if 
you decide uh, you want to make a nice lifestyle change and, and you want to go out and do several weeks, if not months, of exercise training and really kind of change your life, change your kind of physiology based off an exercise training program. Well, uh, this chronic response to exercise training is actually pretty well studied. Um, there are a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analyses looking at all the previous research that has been done, but this is kind of a, a nice overview of what will happen. So chronic exercise will lead to a decrease in your blood pressure. Um, it depends um, on several factors, but this is what uh, allows that chronic response. So first you have an increase in the vascular length. So your uh, vasculature will actually get longer and, and more kind of uh, tuned to exercise. You'll have an increase in the precapillary sphincters. So this is the area where blood flows into your capillaries. The sphincters allow a change in the size of, our, of the arterioles and therefore they're a really good controller of the blood flow which will help prevent high blood pressure. Then you have neuroangiogenesis, which is the creation of new uh, blood vessels, um, new capillaries. And what this does is this increases your total vasculature, which reduces your average resistance on that normal blood flow. Uh, then you have reduction in inflammatory cytokines. Inflammatory cytokines are something that causes oxidation and therefore degrades the vascular compliance of your blood vessels. Uh, then you have enhanced baroreceptor sensitivity. The baroreceptors are um, blood pressure sensors that are in your vasculature that will, if there's an increase in blood, uh, blood pressure, that baroreceptor will send a signal to uh, the brain and the rest of the body that you need to undergo some vasodilation to reduce the blood pressure. Then again, you have this reduced norepinephrine, which leads to reduced peripheral vascular resistance. And then you will also see a bump in antioxidants, which help fight uh, oxidative stress, which again is kind of those inflammatory cytokines and things that will degrade uh, the compliance and, or, or just the compliance of your vasculature. So here's a look at a meta-analysis table. So something uh, that I'll probably show in future videos are meta-analyses. Um, and, and what a meta-analysis does is it looks at a bunch of studies and it looks at the effect sizes of the studies or all the studies uh, in this kind of category and then compares the statistics of those studies against each other. So you're really looking at a whole bunch of studies with, as opposed to individual sample sizes. And this leads to increased accuracy um, as well as just a better kind of understanding of the overall literature. So I looked at a few meta-analyses and, and this is one I found and I liked that looked at exercise uh, types and blood pressure changes. And as you can see here, the net change in blood pressure for most of these types of exercises uh, are to the left of this middle line, this zero. So there in general is a net change and it's a statistically significant net change in a lot of these effect sizes. So as you can see, um, aerobic exercise, we seem to have pretty much all four of the different types and levels of hypertension, prehypertension, and normal blood pressure seeing a bump uh, or a reduction in blood pressure. Resistance exercise, um, we actually see here that for hypertension, we're not really sure if there's a benefit um, of resistance training for reductions in blood pressure. Then we have combined training. Again, uh, some of these bars are overlapping the zero, which means we can't really be uh, sure that there's a statistical significant difference um, in blood pressure change if you do some of these training programs. Um, and then finally, we have the isometric resistance group, uh, which they didn't have enough information to break it up into normal blood pressure, prehypertension, and hypertension. However, again, this review focused on the fact that really aerobic exercise seems to be the type of exercise that has the most evidence for being beneficial for reduction in blood pressure. However, there is some evidence to indicate that specific types of resistance training 
are beneficial uh, for uh, reductions in blood pressure. And something also to note is the fact that they indicated that the, it, sorry, the group that experiences the best benefits for blood pressure is the group with the highest blood pressure. So hypertension experiences the biggest bump, while prehypertension may see a slightly better bump than normotensive individuals. I always like these kind of um, meta-analysis tables, which are looking at kind of moderating effects. So uh, what groups of individuals experience the biggest change in blood pressure per se. So as you can see here, uh, the males actually saw um, for this paper, the biggest effect size change you can see from a negative 1.3 to a negative 4.5 change in blood pressure. Um, it was kind of interesting that younger adults, adults seem to see a slightly bigger effect change. However, um, individuals that, or sorry, individuals over 50 also saw a nice benefit um, for this change. However, this is kind of where what I was talking about earlier, where uh, a change in hypertensive status is actually one of the biggest indicators whether you're going to see a big change in blood pressure. So really those hypertensive individuals are the ones that are seeing this huge effect of exercise. So kind of that's the big takeaway, this idea that if you do have a high blood pressure, uh, there may be a benefit to exercising. And obviously I'm not a doctor, so um, if you decide that you want to do exercise to try to improve your blood pressure, um, make sure to talk to your doctor about whether it's uh, safe to do. However, I know from my personal uh, experience as a researcher and some of the clinical trials um, that I work on, uh, exercise does seem to be beneficial for blood pressure and a whole host of uh, cardiovascular health. So um, that's actually all for today's video. Um, again, if you're interested in these research papers, I'll leave them down in the link below. Also, if you're interested in the book that I use for the actual uh, exercise physiology classes, then take a look in the link below. Again, I have uh, the more recent version, which is the most expensive, uh, the normal version, which is kind of middle of the road, which is what I used when I was in exercise physiology classes, and then an even more previous version, which is probably just as good, uh, but it's a lot cheaper. So uh, thanks again for listening to these exercise physiology reviews. If you have any comments, uh, leave them in uh, the comment section below. Uh, please leave a like and uh, make sure to subscribe for more videos. So thanks and have a nice day.